In the ever-evolving landscape of life, it's imperative to seek clarity amidst the myriad of choices and distractions that vie for our attention. Discovering our core product, the essence of our purpose and potential, is the key to unlocking a meaningful and fulfilling existence. This guide will illuminate the path to identifying your core product, empowering you to align your actions and decisions with your deepest values and aspirations. It gives us that freedom and eternal life. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, something in a very simplistic way. And I gave it a title, uh, or we gave it a title, Three Ways to Simplify Your Life. Three Ways to Simplify Your Life. I'm going to read you this little story on how sometimes human beings complicate things. And sometimes when people talk to us, they might use huge, big, massive words where you might have a wow impression or you scratch your head as if you have understood nothing. But it was that impression that, you know, this, uh, this sounded very big. But it could be a very empty void statement, really, even though it is put in a very big concept. There was these two people called Holmes and Watson. Holmes and Watson, they went out on a camping trip. And early at night time, very early in the morning, still very dark night time, Holmes wakes up and he looks and he sees the stars. He wakes up his friend Watson. You know, they were sleeping in the tent. So he wakes up Watson and he says, Watson, Watson, get up. What is it, Holmes? He said, look into the sky, what do you see? He says, I see a lot of millions, millions of stars and maybe potentially billions of planets. And then Holmes says to Watson, what does that tell you, Watson? And then Watson comes back with these big, massive words. He says, Holmes, this tells me that astronomically speaking, there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically speaking, it tells me that Saturn is not Leo. Orologically speaking, it tells me that it's about quarter to three in the morning. Meteorologically speaking, it tells me that tomorrow will probably be a beautiful day. Theologically speaking, it tells me that God is sovereign and we are a minute part of this great whole. Why, Holmes? What does that tell you? Holmes replies and says, Hey, Watson, you idiot, that tells me our tent has been stolen. <laughs> we complicate things, therefore we miss out on the simple things in life. And what matters is the simple things. They are the foundations. Because if you look at the big massive things, you, lo you lose your track on the small things, yet those small things make all the difference in life. Our tent is stolen, brother. If it rains, we're in deep trouble. Well, not only that, somebody took it. So instead of giving me all this big lecture, go and find who stole the tent. And don't we do that in life? We start talking about big stuff. I've got to do this, and I've got to do that, and I'm planning, and I'm dreaming, and I'm doing this. And then the simple one thing is I didn't even say good morning to my brother, to my sister. I didn't even ask, were you okay? Did you have a good night's sleep? Did you have any nice dreams or any nightmares? No, we talk about big massive things. And then you might say, you might get that reply and say, well, you know, I was expecting at least to say hello. But duh. Um, 
St. Paul in Philippians 3.13, he says, Philippians 3.13, he says, My heart is fixed. This one thing I do, forgetting the things behind and pressing toward the mark. He says, My heart is fixed. What is it fixed on? One thing, not many things. What is my heart fixed on? How many things do we have going through our head? He said, my heart is fixed on only one thing. What is that one thing, St. Paul? He said, I want to forget the things behind me so that I can press forward to the mark and hit it bullseye. You only need one thing. Three ways to simplify your life. You cannot, you cannot replay the past and pre-play the future simultaneously. You cannot replay the past and pre-play the future simultaneously. You can't have the past and the future going together at the same time. You can't think of your past and think of your future at the same time. The two uh, d d CDs or DVDs cannot be running at the same time because you are doing yourself nothing but confusion. Simplify your life. The first way, determine the core product of your life. Determine the core, core means the heart, the center, the most important. Determine the core product of your life. What is the core product of your life? One child asked his mom, he said, Mom, what is the core product of your life? What is the most important thing in your life? She said, Son, I don't have anything that is core product to me. I don't have anything important. All I care about is I raise you as my children and do my best to get you to heaven. Well, he said, getting us to heaven, Mom, this is a core product. What is the most important thing that comes to your mind that you want to achieve? Focus on one thing. Don't focus on many things. What is the most important thing? Is heaven the most important thing that you want to achieve and be part of at the end? Or is it a book that you want to write or you want to read? What is the core product of your life? By the way, speaking of books, There is something very significant about books, very important, very big. A book, a book is your presence without your energy. A book is your presence without your energy. You see, God sent His only beloved Son to this earth, to this world. God sent His only beloved Son to this world. He stayed here about 33 years and a bit. But after leaving, He left us a book called the Holy Bible. See, that book can be anywhere, can be read anytime, can be with anyone at any place and any time. Jesus in the flesh, he is not with us anymore, but his book is with us all the time. Do we make the Bible as the core product of our life? Do we make the Bible as the core product of our life? Who is your friend? Is your friend your core product in life? Is your relationship that you are engaged in or you are about to engage in is the core product of your life. Because whatever you make the center of your life, that's what you're going to become and you're going to reach at the end. Are you wasting time with some people that you're with right now? You want to simplify your life? Determine what is the most important thing for you that you want to achieve. If you want to become a doctor, if you want to become a lawyer, if you want to become a scientist, whatever you want to become, then you need to understand everything comes with a price. Everything comes with a sacrifice. Everything, nothing comes for free. And you want to achieve big things, you better let go on a lot of things in order to achieve big things. I cannot... I cannot, I cannot say to myself that yes, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a scientist, whatever, something, something of, of importance in society. 
yet I say, I still want to have fun. I still want to keep the friends that tell me, let's go downtown. I still want to keep my lifestyle and the pleasures. It doesn't work. You want to become something of importance? You need to let go. Therefore, you need to determine what is the core product that you want to have to achieve and to become. Once you determine that, then you can see where you're heading and you, who you are associating yourself with. You cannot afford to say, I don't care. I don't know. None of my business. What are you doing? Nothing. I like this one. What are you doing? Nothing. Is there such a thing as nothing? Because if I keep on saying nothing, nothing, then I will believe it, then I'll become it. I'll become a nothing. I won't even get Centrelink payments. You need to find your core product in order to see where you want to get yourself to, which level you want to become. For example, and it is the most, ex the most important example, if you make the Holy Bible, if you make the Holy Bible the center of your life, the core of your life. You know, the book, the book contains life. The book contains conversation. But another very important point that the Holy Bible contains is that by reading the Bible, you find out something in 20 minutes that could have taken someone 20 years to write. When you read a book, you are reading an experience that is so substantial, so depth, so deep of someone's experience. This person, it took him 20, 40, 100 years to put it on paper. But for me and you, it took us 20 minutes, one hour to read and obtain the experience of a 20 year old one. A book teaches you a lot of things in a shortcut. Example, in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is referred to King Solomon, who happens to be the son of King David, who wrote the book of Psalms. King Solomon talks in the book of Ecclesiastes about, if you read it, to sum it up, about repentance. How to live a life of repentance in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, how long did it take King Solomon to write this book? It took him his entire life. And actually, the book of Ecclesiastes was written at the end of his life on earth. When he was an old man, yet very wise, according to human level. He wrote a book that is his life story. He is telling us his life story in a book. How long did you live? You ask someone, 50, 70, 80, 100 years. After 100 years, I wrote a book. I pick up that book. I can read it in one week, if I'm a slow reader. I can read the book of Ecclesiastes in one week if I'm slow. It took him his entire life. The book gives you information extremely, extremely in a very short time, yet you are gaining a lifetime experience of the author or the writer. Very important. You got to identify the books you read. What are you reading? In the book of Ecclesiastes, it talks about repentance. King Solomon if any human being has the four following things, they can do whatever they want. If any human being can have these four things, you can do whatever you want. If you have authority, power, King Solomon was a king. That's the highest authority you could ever get. If you can have wealth, the Bible says that King Solomon counted the gold that he had as dirt of the earth. That meant he was extremely, extremely rich man. He had gold as much as the soil is in this, in this world. Thirdly, 
If you're healthy, he had 700 wives, and you need to be healthy to have 700 wives, right? And wisdom, you need to be smart. King Solomon was giving wisdom by the Almighty God himself that no one else before you will ever have the wisdom that you have. So, power, king, wealth, plenty of it. Healthy, plenty of it. <laughs> and smart, the wisest guy on earth. That's why he came back and said in the book of Ecclesiastes, he said, whatever my eye wanted to see, I never say no. I never said no to my eye. Look as much as you want to look. Enjoy as much as you want to enjoy. Whatever my heart desired, I said, you're going to get it, brother. You want this girl? You're going to have her. You want to go overseas? We're going to go. You want to eat? Let's eat. You want to drink and become drunk? You have all the alcohol that you want and desire. I kept nothing neither from my eye nor from my heart. And at the end of his life, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he comes back and says, everything under the sun is vanity. Everything is all vanity of all vanities. Everything is empty. Everything is absolutely nothing. Some people say we want to sort of experience it for ourselves. I want to find out for myself. You know what? I'm still young. Yeah, but the book is ready here. Read the book, read the book and the Bible will tell you of someone who has gone through it all. You are not a king. This guy is a king. You are not as wealthy as this guy. You are not as healthy as this guy. You are not as wise as this guy. Listen to, the, to this person who has more experience than you. He said to us, I enjoyed life like everyone else wants to enjoy life. And if you say to this person, don't do this, it is wrong. They say, you know what? Scare a life, leave me, let me live my life. I need to explore. I want to find out for myself. I want to know what is right and what is wrong. Let me see for myself. But my dear friend, the question is, what guarantees you that when you walk in this path, you'll be able to come back from it? There is no guarantee. Who says that when you drink a particular substance, you're going to be able to let go of it? Who's going to say if you walk in this path, you're going to survive from it? While you want to know, read the book. What is the core product in your life? When you read the book, you'll find a lifetime experience of a guy giving it to you in five hours. When you read that book, you don't need to experience for yourself. Someone else has done the job for you. And he copped it very badly on the chin. It's all empty. I had everything that, I, that anyone desired to have. And I've done everything more than anyone else on the face of this earth. You cannot ask for anyone to have more experience than me. Then get it from the source. I'm telling you, everything you do under the sun is empty. Outside God. Simplify your life by coming back to the source and see what God is telling me and telling you today. You don't need to go out and explore for yourself. You don't need to go and expose yourself to things that you cannot handle later on. God is telling us tonight, you do anything outside of me, 100% you will fail. You do anything that is not approved of me, you can never succeed in life, even if you succeed. Then this is the question that the Lord Jesus asked, which is the most, and I could say not only the most important, but the only important question that any one of us should really attempt to answer. The Lord said, what does it gain a man if he gains the whole world, yet loses himself? But a blessed is he who denies himself for me, for I tell you, 
he shall find it in the end. What's the point of me having fun, enjoying life, being successful in this world, and doing whatever I want, achieving whatever I want to achieve, doing it all wrong under the sun, and I'm exceeding, I'm actually flying high, I'm becoming something much greater than I used to be. I am now something massive in the eyes of the world, but at the end, my dear friend, there is death that will take everything away from you. You want to enjoy life? Enjoy it with the Lord Jesus. You want to know what success is? When you have Christ as your Lord and Savior, as your holy companion, the friend that you should be really associating with. Then after that, go out and enjoy life. Have Christ in your heart, in your mind, in your entire being. Determine the core product of your life. And who is the core product of your life? Is it a person? Is it a thing? Is it God, Jesus? Who is the core product? Number two. You want to simplify your life? Just one thing. Believe you me. Believe you me. When you practice you when you practice listening to the word of god when you practice talking about jesus christ when you practice reading listening hearing the word of jesus christ i can assure you the word of the lord will give you a very simplistic lifestyle yet extremely rich that no one can ever make it possible for you or buy it off you no one it is so simple yet so precious at the same time what god gives no one can give number two identify your immediate divine domain of responsibility identify your immediate divine domain of your responsibility responsibility is another important thing in our life when people are irresponsible when people are no longer responsible for their actions for their deeds for their way of talking for their way of walking for their attitude for their behavioral pattern they will do anything and everything under the sun that is illegal and the worst thing they could do ever in their life is the denial, the very source of their life, God the Almighty. And don't we see that in the 21st century? Who says there is a God? Well, if there is no God, then who says that you exist? Like somebody asked, like somebody asked and said, well, who said, he was, he was actually asking a question to the professor. He said, well, who says that I, uh, I exist? You see, because they were talking about God and God's existence and God brought everything into existence. And then he said, well, you're saying that. Then who says that I do exist? And the professor said, uh, I, I would ask, uh, then I will say to you, uh, may I ask who is really asking the question? If you don't exist, then who is asking this question? We become very silly. We become very silly to say, and who says, I exist? Then if you don't exist, then who asked the question? Responsibility. If there is a lack of responsibility, there is a lack of ownership. When God put Adam in the Garden of Eden, he gave to Adam a responsibility. He said, I want you to look after this garden. You are responsible, Adam, to look after this garden. That's what I'm giving you. And Adam, because he felt for a short moment that he is not responsible for the job that was allocated to him by the Almighty God, therefore he denied the presence of God 
and broke what God told him not to break. It was that irresponsibility of Adam that made him eat from the tree. If he had said that, God, I am responsible before you. You gave me a job that I need to always look after and be very alert and careful of it. If I am aware of things, I, I have a, a less and lesser chance of making a mistake. You see, why do we make mistakes? Because we forget. And why do we forget? Because we do not feel that we are responsible. When you don't feel or see yourself responsible, you can walk away from anything very easily. You can walk away from a relationship easily. You can walk away from a job very easily because you are not responsible for it. But if you are responsible, even if you feel the pain, even if you suffer, you will last the distance because I have an obligation toward my family, my job, my conscience can't say otherwise. But when someone says very easily, I don't care, whatever happens, who cares, to hell with it, that tells me you don't have the sense of responsibility, then you will be open to a lot of errors in your life. You want to simplify your life? Be responsible to what you have. Be responsible toward that thing. Because if you're not, then you're opening a door for a lot of problems and trouble coming your way. You are part of the family. Are you responsible for being a member in this family? You realize that you make a chain, a link of this big chain called the family. If I take this link out, the whole chain is going to collapse. Family is not just about dad. Family is not just about mom. Family is not just about the kids. Family is about dad, mom, the kids combined together. That is a family. So when you are at home, living under the roof of the very house which your parents have provided for you, are you responsible toward your parents? Or are you going to say, mom and dad, it is none of your business. Do not interfere with my life. I'll do whatever I want. I'll go wherever I want to go. And I'll say whatever I want to say. And I'll dress whichever way I want to dress in. That tells me you are not responsible. Therefore, this irresponsibility will eventually end you up in a lot of problems. Mixing with the wrong bunch of people, doing the wrong things, and then hurting yourself and hurting others. Responsibility. Responsibility. Then ask yourself, if Adam's domain was the Garden of Eden, what is our domain? What is your property? What is your territory? Where do you draw the line? With your relationships that you have with people, do you have a defined line for that relationship or is it just an open gate? Whatever. I'm just, I just go with the flow, bro. I need to have a defined line. I need to have a defined line. Domain means it is a marked territory. There's a border. It's not an open fence or a place without a fence. I need to have a defined line to my domain. What is your domain? Identify that. Where are you standing? Where is your belonging? Is it in the street? Is it ending up with nothing? Is it living in darkness is it going astray or do you want to be something that is of benefit to yourself to your family to society and to the people that you have in your life what is your worth your domain determines your worth your property determines how much you are worth Everybody needs to know, what is my property? Where do I belong? Who do I need to look after? Who am I responsible for? You cannot say, I don't take responsibility. 
none of my business, I don't care. It just doesn't work. Life cannot move one split second forward without responsibility. If God is not responsible for the universe that he has created, nothing will live. Determine the core product of your life. What is the most important thing for you or the most important person for you? Identify your immediate divine domain of responsibility. Number three, visualize your desired future continuously. Visualize your desired future continuously. Visualize your desired future continuously. Picture your future all the time. Dream, picture it. What kind of future do you want to have? What kind of future do you want to end up with? Do you want to have a bright future or a dark one? Do you want to have a beautiful future or an ugly one? Do you want to have a future of despair? What kind of future do you want? Visualize it. Picture it always in your head. I want to achieve this. I want to become this. I want to do this. And when you start picturing things for the future, you will start implementing them in your life. I'm sure no one wants to be a drug addict. No one wants to be an alcoholic. No one wants to be a thief. No one wants to be a rejected in society. No one wants to be a second class citizen in society. Then if you don't want to be none of these things, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Then if you want to be something good, you want to have a bright future, therefore you need to be responsible for the domain that you're in. And therefore you need to identify the core product of your life. There are three, simple, three ways to simplify your life. But these three ways, you need to work hard on it because simplicity does not come with ease. It comes with hard work. You see, when I, when I know what is the most important thing that I need to be, come and have, when I'm responsible for that thing that I have, when I'm visualizing a bright future for me, then that will let me work extra hard to maintain that lifestyle. And when you work hard at it, then what's going to happen? You're going to avoid problems in life. But when you take it easy, then it becomes complicated. But when you work hard on it, life becomes very simple. Because you've avoided a lot of problems by being alert and always watchful and mindful. I can't say, I'm just going to go with so-and-so and I'll hope for the best. No. You cannot afford to do that. If you have an assignment to do, you have an exam to do, you have a project to complete, this comes number one. My friends, they'll come later. My having fun going out will come later because if I want to finish this, if I want to graduate, you know what? If I keep on going out with my friends, I will never graduate. And then I will drop from school. And then when you drop one year, two years, you'll go cold. You won't even feel like going back and studying. Stay hot. Stay focused. Because the moment you let go, it's very hard to come back. Don't give up. Always strive to do good things. Determine the core product of your life. Identify your immediate divine domain of responsibility. You are a responsible person. God created you and gave you responsibility. You cannot escape from it. You cannot say, I don't care. Whatever happens, let it happen. You cannot afford the price that you will pay for. You can't, believe me. Visualize your desired future continuously. Now, I'm going to give you three, maybe four things, if I can, to learn about how to live your life. Three or four things to learn on how to make your life a little bit better, easier, and, and learn how to live it. Wisdom gives you that, gives you that opportunity to learn how to live wisely on earth. God often, or often, packages his greatest gifts 
in his most flawed vessels. God often packages his greatest gifts in the most flawed vessels. God often puts some val great values in people that you cannot stand their guts. God puts beautiful things in certain people that you can't bear talking to and associate yourself with. What are you going to do when you come across difficult people in life? Yet there are some good values in them, but they are difficult people. Are you going to just kick him out of your life? Are you going to just wipe him from existence as far as you're concerned? Or are you going to be approaching it in a wise way where how can I get this beautiful gift out of this stubborn person? God more often puts his greatest gifts in flawed vessels. Flawed vessels are shocking people. Hard people. How do I deal when I see someone that is very hard in my life? Especially if that person is my immediate family. There are certain people that you can say I'm walking away from. And maybe you can afford to do that. But can you walk away from dad? Can you walk away from mom? Can you walk away from brother, sister? Someone who is always in your face. Someone who is part of your life whether you like it or not. And you can never wipe it. Yet they are difficult. What are you going to do? My dad, Bishop, he comes from Iraq, old-fashioned man. I keep on saying, you've got to get an XP brother. He is one of those old Apple. Our hard drives don't communicate. I speak one language, he speaks another. He keeps on referring to Bahshika. I say, no Bahshika, this is Fairfield, Nita City, brother. I can never relate to my dad. You know, I keep on, I make it so simple. Dad, I, your son, want this, 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 this. And then dad says, <laughs> shut your mouth. That's all I get from my dad. Shut up. Go away. You're exactly like your mom. No brain. <laughs> God puts one of some of his greatest gifts in very flawed vessels. Regardless who that person is, they may be stubborn, they may have their own weaknesses, but if I have the Lord Jesus, I should be able through his grace, dig out the gold that is hidden in my dad who is stubborn. There needs to be a way. How do I approach a difficult person and a difficult situation? What do I do in a situation that does not want to really open up? Do I scream? Do I fight? Do I break things? I go wild and lose it and that's it, I go and get drunk or bash someone? Or run out of home? Is that the solution? My parents give me a hard time, that's it, I don't care. Hey brother, let's find a room, we'll share it together. All right, we're going out. Is that an answer to it? If you have an, a target, if you have an objective in life, then you will know how to plan your life for it. Therefore, you will know with the Lord's grace, of course. And that's why I said if you really have the Bible as the core product of your life, that will teach you more than enough wisdom to overcome any obstacle and every obstacle that you will encounter in your life. And there is no life without an obstacle. No one escapes trials and tribulations. No one. Even the owner of the two worlds, the heaven and the earth came and he went through hell. Everybody goes through hell. According to how much they can absorb and take on board. But everybody goes through hardships. How are you going to do that? How are you going to relate to people? Keeping in mind, by seeing someone difficult, don't forget 
that they might see you difficult as well. So what is the fairness of treatment here? Am I the only one who's going to be pointing the finger and blaming everyone except myself? Recognition of greatness guarantees access to it. Recognition of greatness guarantees access to it. Never enter the presence of true greatness without acknowledging that greatness. When you are sitting somewhere and somebody walks in that has done something extraordinary, you better go and say, well done, congratulations on this achievement. When you acknowledge the greatness, you will have access to that greatness. When someone at high school finished year 12 and he got the highest mark in Australia, next time you see that person, whether it's to be a boy or a girl, you go and say, you know what? I really look up to you and I'm very proud that there are people that can achieve so much in life. Pray for me that I can do the same. When you acknowledge a greatness, no matter what that greatness is, you will have a very good chance of getting an access to it. Then that person will come back and might say to you, if you ever need my help, I'm always here. And it's going to be for free. Because you, ad you acknowledge that greatness. When you go to dad who is stubborn and surprise your dad out of nowhere, he has never heard it before. And you go and say, dad, you know what? Regardless of what happens, but you are the most important person for me in life. I love you to death and I will swap you for nothing. Nothing comes anywhere near as valuable as you are. It takes a word to change history. Well, it took one word, who is the Logos, that changed the history of man mankind, not for a time frame, but for eternities. In the beginning was the word. This word came down and he showed us how to recognize greatness. You see, when Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of Man, the human being like us, when Jesus of Naz Nazareth, as a human being who had the free will, by the way, he had the free will to say no. But he chose to say yes to his daddy because he found greatness in daddy, in the Almighty God. He found greatness. When he recognized that greatness, when he acknowledged that greatness, he had access to that greatness. Then, then God the Almighty raised his son from the dead. And the Bible says that every power, every dominion in heaven, on earth, and under the earth is being given to the hands of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the supreme authority over everything. How great he is, 2,000 years and 16 years on top has gone by and Jesus is still going as strong as ever. Millions of people, maybe you're not aware, millions of people are converting and coming to Christ from all walks of life and all different religions of the world. Millions are coming to Jesus and blessed is the soul that recognizes this greatness because when you recognize this greatness, you will have access to it. When you say, Jesus, you are mighty. Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are the way. Jesus, you are my light. You're my salvation. You are my refuge. You are my shelter. You are my everything. When you recognize this greatness, Jesus will come back and say to you, then I give you myself. Whatever you need, my child, I am there for you. Whenever you need me, I'm here. This interest, this interest is a signal to exit. This interest is a signal to exit. Sometimes it is good to have no interest in something. 
Because when you are disinterested in a person or disinterested in a situation, that will give you the opportunity to exit from that situation and to walk away from that person. The Lord Jesus said it. It is from the Lord. It is a divine present. The Lord Jesus said, when He sent the disciples, He said, when you go and when you enter a house or a town or whatever and say hello, if people are not interested in you, in what you are bringing to them, then what do you do? You take everything that you brought to them and walk away. They're not interested. They made me disinterested in what I was going to give them. Always with interest comes honor. And honor is the celebration of the indifference. Maybe what I'm saying to some of us, maybe we're not sort of grasping it as yet. It's all right, one day we will. With every interest, there is honor. You see, when you are interested in something or someone, you will honor that thing or that someone. If you are not interested, you're not, not going to show honor. And honor is the celebration of the indifference. When I meet a person that is different to me and I'm interested in that person, I am honoring that person with his entire or her entire indifference to me. But when you are disinterested, you will walk away. And sometimes it is good to have disinterest in things in life because that is your only escape goat to be free from there. So don't be upset when people say, I don't want to associate with you. Don't be upset when people push you away and say, we don't like you anymore. The Lord says, don't dwell on it. Don't keep on going back and say, I want to be a friend. Please don't let me go. Please don't let me go. I want to stay with you. I want to stay with you. Don't do that. You're going to be choking yourself and choking them. Take away everything that you have and be free. Maybe it's a good thing. People that do not want to accept my, sal my salute, no hard feelings. I said hi, they, didn't, they were not interested, so that was an escape for me to walk away. They're not interested, I'm not interested. I'm not going to force it. I'm not going to on, go on and keep on saying hello, 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 no, no. Problems are invitation to a change. These are all wisdom statements. Problems are invitations to a change. If Pharaoh of Egypt had not had a problem, Joseph wouldn't have had a change in his life. It was Pharaoh's problem that made Joseph the second highest level in Egypt. The right hand of Pharaoh. What was the Pharaoh's problem? He saw a dream. He brought all the sorcerers, all the magic fortune tellers. He said, reveal the dream. They did not know. Joseph, in that prison, in that dungeon, had that gift of explaining a dream. You see, Pharaoh's problem brought a change to someone's future. Problems are healthy sometimes. They give me opportunities to go beyond my capacity. To go and explore horizons that I wouldn't have even dreamt of exploring. When a car breaks, a driver's got a problem. That's where the mechanic rises like the morning star and says with all the grease on his body, here I am, bro, I am your savior. Imagine life without a problem. Absolutely shocking. I'm sick, that's a problem. Doctors become rich. I'm going crazy. Psychologists become well known. There is, uh, I always forget his name, may he forgive me. He is one of the most renowned psychiatrists in America. I'll find the name for you next time. He is so famous, so well known, very, very, very successful in his field. Extremely rich man. 
So one day these people came and approached me and said, can you tell us your secret? How come you are so popular? People like just line up just to have a, a, fi a minute with you. He said, it's very simple. Don't complicate things. He said, when I have a patient, someone sits in front of me, all I do is I let that person talk and I just do the following expressions and sounds. Really? Oh, no. Wow. Uh, mm. They talk and I just say, hum, ha, hi, ha, hu. Sounds like Chinese. Mm. Ninja turtle. And then they get up and they say, you are the best. Thank you. You saved me. You changed me. I haven't done nothing. All I did was, ha, hu, ha. <laughs> But you see, if people don't have a problem, I don't prosper. Nobody knows who I am. Nobody recognizes. If the world did not have a problem, God wouldn't have come. So whenever you have a problem in life, do you recognize it as an opportunity for a better change? It's, an, it's a chance for me to do something that I, that I did not have an opportunity to do without this problem arising. Don't look at it as a, as a negative thing. Look at it as a positive thing. As a positive thing. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll rush through it. Problems are opportunities for you to show your worth to somebody else. Problems are opportunities for you to show how much you are worth for someone else. Problems are seeds for significance. Problems are seeds for significance. When there is a problem, there is a chance that I become something big, significant. You need to see that problem, recognize that problem, and solve that problem. If you're able to see the problem, recognize it, acknowledge it, and then tackle it and solve it, you are loved forever and ever and ever. Problems are good. I'll tell you a little problem which is a true story. One day this mother had two children. Obviously one older, one younger. <laughs> they were not twins. <laughs> so the older son went to school before the younger one. Now the younger one, he had his own place, uh, his own kingdom, his own domain, his own toys that he used to play at home while his older brother was at school. Anyway, days, days went by, and then this younger boy needed to go to school now. So mommy took the younger boy to school. The moment she dropped her son at school, World War III started. Mah! Crying, man, the whole school came out. What's wrong? Take me home, take me home. Crying, he turned everything upside down. She was forced to take him home. Second day she, st she tried, one hour later they called to come and pick your son, he's going to kill himself. Another day, for weeks, for weeks, he did not spend one hour at school for months. She tried everything under the sun, it's not working, her son is getting worse and worse and worse. One day she went to this priest, it's a true story, she went to this priest and said, Father, please, I beg you, come, maybe you can help me, my son is going to kill me. He doesn't want to go to school. A few months went by. He hasn't even gone. He hasn't studied nothing. I, I don't want him to miss out on school. Come, Father, please, home to our place and see. Maybe you can find the problem. There's a problem. <laughs> so the father goes, the priest, and he sits at home. Firstly, he, he makes an observation of the environment at home. And then he realizes, he recognizes the problem. He acknowledges the problem and he gives a solution to that problem which rectified everything just like that. He said, I know what your son's problem is. I kiss your feet, father, please tell me. I buy you fish burger, hamburger, chocolate sundae, everything. He said, it's very easy. He said, go and buy a big tin box or metal box. And you see those toys of your son Put those toys in that box and make sure that box has a place where you can put a locker on it. And then lock it and then take that key and put a string 
tie it to a string and put it around his neck and let him watch you while you're putting the toys in the box, while you're locking the box, while you are taking the key and putting it around his neck and then take him to school. I can assure you he will never come back. She did that. Solved the problem. Apparently, psychologically, this little kid said, this is my kingdom. When I go to school, who's playing with my toys? Who guarantees me that my toys, my kingdom is safe? But now that I saw with my eyes, they are in a locked box and the key is with me. So, then and then, brother, I can enjoy life. I can enjoy life. Now, this priest now has become significant in the eyes of this mother. He solved a problem. He wouldn't have been recognized if it had not been for that problem. Problems are invitation to rewards. What is your reaction to a problem? You want to be rewarded? Face a problem, don't run away from it. Face a problem, don't run away from it. Face a problem, don't run away from it. You want to be rewarded? Solve it. You don't want to get nothing? Walk away, you'll get nothing. Three simple things to simplify, three ways to simplify your life. Determine the core product of your life. Identify your immediate divine domain of responsibility. What are you responsible for? And to whom are you responsible? And visualize your desired future. What kind of future do you want to have? Associate yourself with the Holy Bible. Associate yourself with the Lord Jesus. The rest will just fall into place so easily. God bless you. Let's stand for the uh, finale prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. In conclusion, identifying your core product is a transformative journey, leading you to the core of who you are and what matters most to you. It is not a static concept, but rather a dynamic force evolving as you grow and experience the world. Regularly revisiting and reassessing your core product keeps it relevant and aligned with your evolving aspirations. By making your core product the focal point of your decisions and actions, you create a life of purpose where every choice aligns with your deepest values and yearnings. Remember, your core product is the bedrock of your being, guiding you towards a life of authenticity and fulfillment.